So much to get into on this than with this week's show. Well, if you know me, you know that I have more than a passing interest in cybersecurity. As far as anybody who knows me knows, it's like my top priority is it's, cybersecurity. It's, it's like, like the number two, <laughs> my number one, number two topic that he goes for. And David, you have surprised us again by bringing not just beer into my wheelhouse, but bringing cybersecurity <laughs> to our it's wheelhouse. It's like an early birthday It's gift. like an early birthday gift. It is. David, could you please introduce our awesome guest? I am honored to welcome to the show Brian Hoagley from Side Channel, which is a cybersecurity firm here in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, which I want to brag about for a minute. It's good to have uh, a leading cybersecurity firm right in downtown Worcester. Uh, but Brian, you have a lot of experience. You work for the Department of Defense. You've done programs at the Pentagon, a lot with the intelligence community, Fortune 500. Welcome to the show. This is, just, as Ian mentioned, this is a topic we, we discuss frequently, and it seems like it's for every company at this point, cybersecurity has got to be the number one pressing issue uh, for, that they're facing. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and I'm I'm very excited to now have our headquarters in Worcester. It's uh, it, it's it's really kind of an honor, and and just it's an exciting time. Number one uh, risk or or topic? I don't know. I kind of wish it was honestly. Um, I think a lot of our clients come to us because they're realizing it is a operational risk that should be looked at at from like an enterprise level. They're not sure how to address it yet, and then I still talk to enough people who don't really believe that it's a, it's a concern. Like it's the whole, I'm not, I'm not a target. I'm too small. It's, it still happens. So I was going to say, it's, it's interesting to, to see. I mean, just in the last five years, people went from being, Oh, this isn't a problem that is going to affect me because I'm not a fortune, you know, 500. I'm not, you know, I'm not in the top, but as you know, 2016, 2000 and, and to today, you're seeing, more and more people realizing that it's a problem. And I'm wondering, can you tell us your experience watching the last five mm -hmm. years um, change your business? You know, I left the DOD in supporting them in 2015. Um, I actually started working for the Hanover Insurance Group in 2015. They're the reason that I moved my family and myself up here into uh, the Worcester area. So I was their CISO and vice president for uh, until 2019 when I launched Side Channel. The, um, the, the shape of the industry I really saw was around that time. And there's a couple different things. You've got increased regulations. So New York State was one of the first ones to come out with a really solid and, and defensible security kind of requirements that companies needed to follow if you're inside the financial sector. So now you had you know state regulation because there is no federal standard for cybersecurity. So it's really now kind of on the states and that pushed insurance groups to start embracing better security posture. And people usually change their habits if their insurance requirements are changing. Look at what you do or don't do for your homeowner's insurance that you do to your house. Like it's it's a trickle down kind of a thing. The other piece is just other regulations started coming out. Um, and then you started having boards at larger organizations really start asking about cyber as an operational risk within their organizations. And now once these larger organizations started embracing, they needed to do something, they now start turning and looking at their suppliers and their vendors, which are usually smaller companies. So it's not that there's regulations or, or a real push directly to kind of the mid market or smaller firms. These folks that have traditionally been, I'm not a target, I don't need to. It's that their revenue streams are now potentially being impacted because their customers, their upstream, these larger organizations are looking down at them going, well, I'm not going to continue to do business with you if you don't shape up. So, it's, it's, a, it's a number of these different pressures that just seem to be kind of moving down. And honestly, I think it's, it's all going in the right direction, but we still don't have a federal standard that kind of levels and lays out, hey, everybody should be at this you know, standard or, or setting something. And I think that's where the US is faulting a little bit. I'm a mistake and you correct me if I'm wrong. There are new pressures around doing business with the government, around government contracts where you do need to prove you have an increased cybersecurity profile in order to gain these government contracts. And that's sort of the sneaky way around creating mm -hmm. a, a regulation. But it's it's very helpful because the fact is um, cybersecurity is a tank. It's it's no different than soldiers. It's no different than, this is where the warfare is happening right now. North Korea makes the money they make to launch the rockets because they're hacking and that's their right. job. Russia has an entire building and then a network created throughout the in, in the Pacific Rim of agents that work for them under the guise of you know some startup firm and they're hacking the same thing with china they're hacking this is a source of revenue and it's a 
quite frankly, it's warfare. Cybersecurity is the new front line as far as I'm concerned. I mean, what are your feelings about that? I'm not overstating, am I? No, uh, you're you're right. It is the fifth plane. It's the it's it's the what's known as like the new estate, right? So you got air, land, sea, you know, to 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 fight on. Now you've got a logical plane in which people can conduct espionage activities, even you know, even warfare. We see you know, power grids are susceptible to this, um, and or at least being targeted and at least being talked about. Um, I think there's there's some still play in 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 kind of talking points around how susceptible they really are. Are they a target? Sure. Are they as susceptible as most people try to make them believe? I don't think so. Um, but you also have to look at the motives, right? China's motives, North Korea's motives, and Russia's motives are all completely different from each other, right? Um, and I think you see at the end of it, really, you know, is it military? Is it economic? I believe, and what I've seen is China's, you know, views are purely um, economic. They're able to build out their intellectual properties by stealing other intellectual properties. North Korea's is not economic; it's purely financial. Like we need money to send rockets into space. Let's go steal things to go make us money. Russia is different. I think it's militaristic. It's less economic. But what what I see Russia doing is using those companies in the or organizations in the Eastern Bloc, this kind of shadow group. Here you had years ago, and this is probably where you know a, a big pressure kind of came up. You had all these kids coming out of these colleges in the Eastern Bloc, really smart comp sci students out of Poland, old Soviet, you know, organizations. They couldn't get jobs. Now you've got, then at the same time, you've got all these ex-KGB ex Stasi guys and girls who know how to run teams, motivate people, organize. You put those together and now you have criminal syndicates and those criminal syndicates run like businesses. And this is where it's really interesting when you, when I have a conversation with a, a mid market company and they tell me, Oh, I'm not a target. I'm like, well, let's, let's dive into why you should not think that there is an ROI on the other side of, uh, of this for those companies. Right? There are organizations, criminal groups that are running like businesses. They have HR, they go on holiday, they have payroll, they have benefits, and you can see that their activity goes down. So now that there's an ROI for them to go attack you, they're running it like a business, which means they're going after the things that can make them the most money with the least amount of expense. I mean, this, is, this is kind of pure business tactics. That's happening. And once organizations, you know, good organizations, companies are trying to defend themselves, start thinking about that they need to defend their business for the sake of their business against somebody whose business is now to take over theirs. Now you can stop thinking about, I'm not a target. Purely the fact that you're connected to the internet means that you're available. And if, there, if you're a low cost to get into, then now you become a target and the ROI is pretty high. And maybe it's not you trying to defend yourself for the sake of defending yourself, but larger organizations have bigger budgets, which means they can spend to defend themselves much better. Smaller organizations, not so much. So why don't I, as a bad guy, try to take over a smaller organization, hopscotch into my real target, which is a larger organization? You know, now it's they're organized like real businesses. They're using fronts, you know, as you described, yep. and it, it really is terrifying when you to get into the granular details of it. Yeah, I tend to, I, when I talk about this stuff, people are like, I wish I didn't talk to you about this. Like, <laughs> I don't feel better now having learned all this stuff. I'm like, hey, look, I'm sorry, but the reality is that this is how it works. And there's, there's no dodging it anymore. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just bad timing. You know, it's akin to you had a storefront with a glass window and a lot of great merchandise to, you know, entice people to come in and legitimately buy your stuff. And some guy or girl just happened to walk by with a brick and steal everything out of the front and run off. Smash and grab. Sometimes it's just a commodity attack. Sometimes it's, you know, really well thought out and plotted. Uh, I want to just disclose something really quickly. Um, you are the title sponsor of the NDIA event um, in, uh, in Burlington, and we are the produ yep. production company that's producing that event. So we'll be doing, that's awesome. we'll be seeing you face to face. Um, tell us about this event and why it's such a big deal this year. Yeah. So, you know, back to, you had a great question about, you know, working with the government and kind of the regulations you need to do that work. The NDIA is an organization focused on, um, you know, cyber, well, th this event is around cybersecurity, but for national defense industry. So those organizations that are either supporting the government through manufacturing or services or, or really kind of whatever, you know, the government's procuring from industry, um, NDIA has got a, uh, you know, a representation 
this conference, the sixth, uh, the sixth uh, cyber conference, is centered specifically on cybersecurity around what's known as what we affectionately call the, the DIB or the Defense Industrial Base, and uh, it's it's the focus and the talk tracks are on you know the different areas like what should these companies be doing, what's the latest and greatest as far as tools to be using, what's the latest and greatest on threats to be aware of. One thing I'm curious about. You know the, the industry evolving as, as it has over the years. You know, years ago, uh, it seemed like cybersecurity was was constantly kind of reactive. You know, a, a virus would come through, or a worm would have you and exploit a you know a loophole or wherever they could find it. How has the the cybersecurity business evolved to be more proactive and preventative as opposed to reacting to the latest that's out there? Because by the time we figure out the current worm that's being exploited, there is something else already behind it that's ready to go. Yeah, so I don't think it has changed, honestly. Um, the the views of old were, you know, if I put a firewall in place and I had an antivirus running, I was good. Well, the reality is those things fail. And they fail often because you don't have them properly configured, or sometimes you don't have them at all. Um, or we put too much faith in certain technologies that haven't really proved themselves out. And obviously, attackers change ta tactics. You don't keep doing the same thing that doesn't work and expect a different result. Attackers aren't doing that. They're not dumb. We, they proved that by creating a billion dollar industry. Um, so having more of a detection capability and a response capability. So if you ever follow, I'm a big fan of the NIST cybersecurity framework. If I can plug, I just wrote a book on it. Um, and it's, it's around identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Identify the assets that you have because you can't defend what you don't know exists. Protect those things that you have in place detect when those protections fail, be able to effectively respond to those things that you've detected along the way, and then be able to recover your operations back to a known good state. The, the industry has put so much emphasis on protective technologies that that's all you needed. That in the last five years, um, you know, detection and response have now come up as, as an available resource, and there's some really great technologies and capabilities out there to go use. But that still doesn't mean that you stop, that doesn't mean that you stop doing protection. As you detect things that are getting through basically kind of your, your walls or your gates, right? And you're responding effectively. You should be learning from that and building better protections. There are a lot of new threats. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, there are new means to be able to detect and protect against them. It's, it's trying to get things kind of, as you call left of boom, right? Boom is bad thing happened. It's when we can get things left of boom as much as we can, it means that it's cheaper for us to, to run and manage. Um, and we have less issues, but the reality is bad things are going to happen. We just need to be able to appropriately react. How much does the role of data protection and data recovery as backup play a role in a, in a robust cybersecurity defense for an, for a business? Oh, it's, yeah, it's paramount. You can't, you cannot ignore having backups because at the end of the day, like I said, bad things will still happen. And guess what? Sometimes it's not a person. Sometimes it's mother nature. So we still have to think about, you know, oh, power got knocked out and I lost, you know, data. Okay. Well, I should still be able to restore from backup. We've been doing that for decades and we shouldn't stop doing that. Right. We but, should get better about that. We should implement the newer kind of capabilities. We should leverage the cloud where it's appropriate and secure the cloud. We should, you know, still use things that are, you know, going to last longer, you know, tapes from 20 years ago, if you're still relying on the tapes from 20 years ago as your restoration, you should probably check those tapes because they're probably going to snap and not work. And you're going to be really upset because now your backups that you were expecting to work didn't work. I work with a lot of um, all of our clients, but then just directly just give a lot of advice on this. You need an incident response plan. Something bad will happen. You know, you don't want to try out your incident response plan for the first time when that bad thing happens. You need to practice it, right? You need to make sure that people know what to do. And you know, you can do that through tabletops and you can do that, you know, that flows right into doing recovery pieces, but those are great, great exercise for any company to be able to go run. Do a tabletop exercise on a scenario. Take any bad thing that can happen, right? Ransomware happens to this machine. What do we do, right? In an hour of time of getting collected people, you will have a tremendous amount of insight into what you can and can't actually be able to do to recover. You'll learn things about your organization that you never learned before. Like, why isn't Sally here? She's the one with the decision authority to be able to make the call for us to be able to go do this thing. Or you will pressure test in, in a safe and safe way. What could possibly go wrong on your potentially worst day in a safe, in a safe manner. You need to be able to do that. And again, I can't, I can't trust this enough. 
do not wait until that bad thing happens to test that out, that that plan or anything else for the first time. It never goes well. Thank you so much for being on the show. And I know that there's more to talk about. Maybe we can get you back on for some tips and tricks or some uh, some advice. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and making things safer. We appreciate what your company is doing. And again, sidechannel.com is the site you want to go to. And uh, you can speak with Brian Hoagley. Thank you so much for joining us on Business Beat. No one's too small for cybersecurity. Absolutely. Very true. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that that's as packed an episode as you could possibly yeah, have on this it. show. <laughs> so, I, I learned a lot today. <laughs> you did. You did learn a lot we today. Did. Yeah. We're all we're all better for for being part of Business Speed. So see if you don't if you miss the show, you would have missed right. about the most amazing art museum ever anywhere. And cyber and cybersecurity. Cyber yeah. Very. Important. And by the way, if you're not completely terrified after hearing Brian <laughs> discuss cybersecurity right now, I am completely freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> David's gonna start building his own cyber wall. He's got a bunker. He's working on it right now. It's right behind the right behind his logo. Thanks for listening to the show. We'll see you guys all again next week. Thank you so much.